Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. This is our second to last video on the blood vessels and we're going to focus on tissue perfusion at the level of the capillary beds and how that is actually regulated. Tissue perfusion or the actual flow of blood in the capillary beds is what allows for specific regions in the body, specific tissue, specific organs to actually carry out their functions. So tissue perfusion allows for our typical oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nutrient waste exchange that um, we think of, of what the capillaries do, but also many more functions such as the absorption of nutrients in the small intestine, the formation of urine in the kidneys, just to list a couple of extra examples. So this blood flow in the capillary beds, which we call tissue perfusion, is regulated. But the regulation occurs at a local level, meaning that the capillary beds have the capability of regulating how much blood flows through them all on their own, independent of what is happening to the systemic blood pressure and independent of hormonal and neural regulation, which we studied before. It's kind of analogous to the city water. You know, we have all these big uh, pipes that carry water to our houses, but we are the ones that control where the water comes out, uh, in what room, and how much. And our capillary beds have a similar mechanism, which we call autoregulation. Now, autoregulation can occur via different uh, controls, or control mechanisms, you could call them. They are short-term, or long-term, and the short-term ones include chemical or metabolic controls and myogenic controls. Under long-term, we're looking at the growth of new blood vessels, which we call angiogenesis. So let's take a closer look at these. One of the short-term mechanisms that can control how much blood flows through a capillary bed is called the metabolic control mechanism. And it's completely dependent on the composition, the chemical composition of the blood. And depending on the chemical composition, we're going to see that either those precapillary sphincters we looked at earlier when we studied the, the anatomy of capillary bed are going to open up, or we could say vasodilate, or vasoconstrict so that blood cannot enter the capillaries and instead the blood, blood would have to bypass all the capillaries and leave the capillary bed via the thoroughfare to enter into the post-capillary venule. Let's take a look at the following example. Let's say that a particular tissue in the body is very metabolically active. Now think about that. If a tissue and its cells are very metabolically active, that means they're using up oxygen, they're using up nutrients, they're starting to collect a lot of wastes, including carbon dioxide. Uh, they're going to, we're going to see an increase in the pH, a decrease, I'm sorry, the, the, the acidity level is going to increase, so we're going to see a decrease in the pH, partially due to the development of more and more carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions. Uh, think of um, for instance, skeletal muscles that are going through anaerobic lactic acid fermentation, they're going to build up a lot of hydrogen ions. So think of that scenario. And then the question to ask yourself is, would it make sense to send fresh blood to that particular tissue? And by, mean of, by means of fresh blood, I should say freshly oxygenated, uh, nutrient-rich blood, or not? And the answer, of course, is yes. We do want to send freshly oxygenated, nutrient-rich blood to these cells that are metabolically active, and then at the same time remove the wastes, including the carbon dioxide and the hydrogen ions, so we can restore the pH. And so we can do that, or I should say the capillary beds can do that by controlling those precapillary sphincters. And this all occurs at a very localized level. Now, there are other chemicals that can impact whether vasodilation of those precapillary sphincters occurs or not. So if we see an increase in inflammatory chemicals, 
even an increase in potassium ions, adenosine, and then also an increase in nitric oxide. We've mentioned nitric oxide in our list of hormones in the past to be a, a potent vasodilator. It's, one, it's again, once, a, once again, one of these very localized chemicals, even endothelins, which work opposite. They're going to be vasoconstrictors, and they're going to make sure that the blood is not going to enter the individual capillaries. It's just going to go through that vascular, through that um, thoroughfare, uh, basically a shunt that bypasses the whole capillary bed so that the blood will get dumped pretty quickly into the uh, post-capillary venule. Metabolic controls play a very important part in the brain, as we will see in the, the very last video. Another short-term mechanism is called the myogenic control mechanism. And when you listen to this uh, term, you hear myo in it, which you know by now means muscle, and genic as in genesis, the creation of. So this is a short-term mechanism that originate or is created by the smooth muscle that makes up the, um, the arterioles that feed into the capillary beds as well as the precapillary sphincters. So let's say that the systemic blood pressure has been rising. That means that the blood that's arriving in our vascular bed, in our capillary bed, I'm sorry, um, is, is higher in pressure than it really should be. What can happen is that in response to this, a myogenic mechanism kicks in. And what we see happening is that due to that increased um, intravascular pressure, we're going to see that the precapillary sphincters are actually going to constrict. And when they do that, we're going to see that the amount of blood that's under pretty high pressure is now controlled. We're not just going to bombard these capillary beds with this blood. And so this really helps maintain tissue perfusion pretty constant. Opposite scenario, let's say that blood pressure, systemic blood pressure is dropping. It's dropping below its homeostatic levels. We need to maintain tissue perfusion. We can't just not nourish and supply our metabolically active tissues with blood. And what we'll see in response is that the precapillary sphincters this time will vasodilate in an attempt to maintain the amount of blood that should be present in those capillaries. So these are your two short-term mechanisms, the metabolic mechanism, or you can call it the chemical mechanism or the myogenic mechanism. This flowchart here primarily focuses on the metabolic mechanism, I should say. So metabolic control. So we're going to ensure that tissue perfusion remains pretty constant. And we can do that by adjusting those precapillary sphincters by either relaxing them or constricting them. And we're going to want to relax them when we see things such as drops in oxygen levels in the tissues and a rise in carbon dioxide, a rise in metabolic acids as the tissues are metabolically active, um, along with some inflammatory chemicals. And don't forget that metabolically active uh, tissues are going to also have a high blood uh, temperature. On the other hand, we might also see that the tissues are going to be impacted by constriction of the precapillary sphincters because perhaps vasoconstricting uh, chemicals are released, such as the endothelins and various products released by platelets, including prostaglandins, can impact the blood flow at the capillary beds as well. In addition to those short-term autoregulatory mechanisms for perfusion, we can consider angiogenesis and the increase in the diameter of blood vessels also a form of autoregulation. And these two forms would be more 
a form of long-term autoregulation. So when short-term autoregulation is not going to meet the demands of the, the tissues in the long term, we might see that a, a person will start to grow more blood vessels. Let's say that we've gained weight or let's say that we've become bulkier because we've uh, been working out hard and our muscles have hypertrophied. Um, we may start increasing the number of blood vessels. In some situations, we might see an increase in the size of our blood vessels. Perhaps uh, this occurs when there's some blockage in our coronary circulation or even at high altitude in an attempt to bring more blood to the different parts of the body because at higher altitude, we're going to um, experience thinner air, meaning that there is less oxygen in the air and the blood can compensate for that by increasing the size of blood vessels.